how do we move through those times when they're not easy? What is our capacity to manage when right. things are not easy? And if we have a flexible, adaptive window of tolerance, we are more able to resource ourselves. We're able to still connect and communicate. Why are members of the CHD community more at risk for certain kinds of psychological problems than those outside of the heart world? What makes people more at risk and what can be done about it? Thanks to COVID, people seem more reluctant to leave home for elective medical help. So how can people receive treatment within the privacy and safety of their own homes? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the mother of an adult who was born with a critical congenital heart defect. As a 28-year-old pharmacy tech, my heart warrior constantly inspires me. It is a pleasure to be the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. I'm very excited about today's show to feature a special psychologist. Today's show is entitled Heart Mom, Psychologist on Anxiety, PTSD, Depression, and Treatment. Amy Bjorkman is the mother to a 17-year-old daughter with a single ventricle who has had six heart surgeries and spent her first seven months in the hospital. She is also a licensed psychologist who specializes in trauma for the last 20 years. She is an expert on how the body holds trauma and the concomitant dysregulation of the nervous system that directly impacts our sense of safety and ability to self-soothe. She works with clients from a somatic perspective to enhance their window of tolerance in managing stress, such that they are able to feel more grounded and connected to themselves and others. She has a deep understanding of complex medical trauma from her work, and even more so from her lived experience as a heart mom. She's also in the process of creating a membership program that directly teaches and supports heart moms through this somatic lens. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Amy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you to discuss this topic. It seems like this is a hot topic right now. I've done several shows on mental health, and I think this is going to be a great complement to the programs that we've already done. So let's start by learning about why you chose to become a psychologist who specializes in trauma. Well, I think anybody in my field has a story that they can tell as to why they entered this field in particular. And without going into major specifics, I grew up in a pretty chaotic, abusive home. And my original intent was to work with children and dealing with being from a either a broken home, an abusive home, an alcoholic home, which kind of checks all the boxes that I experienced when I was a child. And I had a deep need from a very young age to want to be a helper and to support those who had similar experiences. Then through my undergraduate experience and then my graduate experience, I realized that I had a bigger calling to an adult population, not so much children, and it just grew from there. And I had originally became a specialist with eating disorders because it just kind of worked out that way with the training that I received. I did all of my training at a college counseling center on campus at Arizona State University. And, you know, surprisingly, you get a lot of different types of clients coming in because there are people going to college using that as their resource for counseling. And I had worked with some really very helpful mentors and supervisors who happened to specialize in eating disorders. And so I then became trained with eating disorders and realized I really enjoyed that particular population. So when I minored in biomedical science with my psychology degree, eating disorders was a perfect blend of being able to deal with the body and the mind at the same time. And it was just a perfect connection for me. Well, then through the work that I was doing as an eating disorder specialist, I quickly learned that most eating disorders are rooted in trauma. And for me to be able to best support those clients, I would need to also be a specialist in trauma. And so that is where it kind of all began because it was a way to best serve the population that I was providing therapy for. 
So then my passion for trauma started because it's such a fascinating field. And so many people have trauma. Now, all of this, keep in mind, happened before I had a child with a heart condition. I was a psychologist before she was born, mm-hmm. and which was great. I mean, great is kind of a funny word, but it prepared me in many ways. I understood a lot of things that, like I said, my minors in biomedical science, I had a good understanding of the body. There was a lot of the terminology and everything that I understood. And then I understood developmental theory and the impact that these types of things would have on my child. So in that way, I was pretty prepared to manage, (laughs) although it doesn't, you know, that's my psychology hat, not my mom hat, which is a whole (laughs) different thing. (laughs) I was going to say, intellectually, you were prepared, but are we ever prepared in our No, we are not. No, not for something like this. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that's fascinating. So how long were you practicing before you had your daughter? I was practicing, let me think. Probably four to five years. And then you count in all the training, you know, the well, clinical sure. training prior to, sure. to that. So I would say it was probably a good, you know. Almost eight, a decade. To, almost a decade of yeah. doing clinical work before right. having my child with a heart condition. I have a son, too, who's two and a half years older than my daughter, who okay. is healthy and doesn't have any issues. Yeah, that was that was all happening in the midst of having this child. And actually, I ended up having to close my practice for two years because she needed a high level of care. And sure. I was the one to do that. Sure. So that was in the middle of all of that. Wow. Okay. So you've been in this area for a long time. And yeah. I imagine you have seen it change a lot. Can you talk to me about some of the changes you've seen over the last two decades? In the work of trauma? In the work of trauma and therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting to watch the way that the field changes and kind of what's the popular way of approaching therapy. And I've been in the practice long enough to see a few different ways come through and how to treat different things. And I would say initially when I began as a therapist over 20 years ago, it was primarily cognitive, behavioral, and theory. And so we spoke mostly about changing irrational beliefs, more talk therapy-based, even Mm -hmm. including trauma work was very behavioral-based or cognitive-based. And not to say that those things still don't exist because they do. But then there was a wave that came through, and you might recall the whole wave around mindfulness Uh and all this mindfulness work and the power of that mind-body connection. So you saw a lot of therapists starting to incorporate more mindfulness strategies to support their work. And there's a whole slew of approaches specific to mindfulness. And most recently, I would say, I can't give you timeline, but just what ended up happening, there became a bigger focus on trauma. And all of a sudden, that became a much more popularized term to use the word trauma. And then approaches to trauma started showing up, EMDR being a really popular Mm -hmm. approach, which is both cognitive and body oriented. So it's like kind of a blend of that mindfulness and CBT. And and so that became kind of the way to approach trauma. And I was a EMDR therapist for over a decade and doing that work with clients and finding it to be really helpful because it's this really intentional skill or tool to support the resolution and processing and reprocessing of traumatic material, which we didn't have anything similar to that prior to EMDR. There's, I won't say nothing, but there are tools that provide protocol-like techniques, but EMDR Mm -hmm. is a very specific protocol that you're trained on to facilitate this work, and it's very effective. Well, then... And that still is used today and more, I mean, people still reach out and people talk about EMDR. It's become almost a normal part of conversation when you talk about trauma. 
And I have people asking for that work, even without even knowing what it means, because somebody yeah. said, oh, you need EMDR. The doctor said, you need EMDR. <laughs> but they actually have no idea what it means. Uh-huh. And so so then I saw a wave, you know, what's happening recently, I would say, again, I can't give you timelines, but what I've noticed in the last probably five years is a real awareness around the body and the body's mm-hmm how the body plays a role in trauma and how we deal with stress and our worldview in general. And COVID really brought that to the forefront. Sure. You know, because COVID as you know, it's, it was obviously this major global pandemic, but it's also this major mental health crisis. And we're still seeing the effects of that now. And I think we will for quite a long time. And it's like how the body holds all of this and manages Mm -hmm. all of this has become really interesting to a lot of people in the field because it's kind of strange how we focus so much on the mind, but the body was just kind of, it's just there. It's not really a part of the conversation. And now it's this, you see it through social media, you see it in articles that lie. It's just like the body, the body, the nervous system, the nervous system, which is fascinating and awesome for me because that's where I went with my work also. Right, right. So then from practicing EMDR, I ended up going into training to become a somatic experiencing practitioner. And that particular training focuses exclusively on the nervous system and the dysregulation and how to support the body's natural way of wanting to cope and complete self-protective responses in response to trauma. What I think is super important underneath all of that is how my daughter was a major driving force for all of that. Because all along through while I'm doing my training, I'm also trying to resource my child. Sure. And because she has a lot of struggles. Sure. And that naturally come with really complex medical issues and complex medical trauma. And she definitely has both of those things. And never really, truly trying to figure out what can help her. What does she need? How can she feel more, feel happier, get better sleep, feel less dysregulated? I mean, there's so many things that were going on coinciding with my work. And I really, at the time I was doing EMDR, but she wasn't a candidate for EMDR because all of her memories associated with her trauma were pre-verbal memories. She doesn't remember any of it. But her and body he, remembers. But her body remembers. Right. And, and EMDR can't get to that. And that just gave me chills with me both as I know. know as we just had that aha we just, experience. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, but it's so true. And so I was, I just went to a, I had gone to a luncheon given by the founder of Somatic Experiencing here in Scottsdale and just to learn about it because I'd heard about it, but I didn't know anything about it. And he's sitting there talking about the almost the entire luncheon about dealing with complex childhood medical trauma and providing a case about a little boy that he helped and provided video and all of this. And all of a sudden I went from being the psychologist in the room to being the mom. The mom. (laughs) And I was just like, this is what my daughter needs. And I immediately, immediately figured out a way to get her into that kind of work. So my family, we went to Colorado and did a two-week family intensive with a somatic experiencing practitioner. And we worked with the whole family system. They worked with her. I mean, it was like every permutation you can think of to support this system because it's a dysregulated system because we've all been impacted by the trauma and we keep replaying it out because her issues are still there. I mean, it's an ongoing thing. It doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, that's when she started to see a somatic practitioner. I didn't have the bandwidth at the time to do the training, but I knew from that point forward, this is the work that I was going to do because it related so much to my clients because I would do EMDR and I'd hit a wall. It, mm-hmm. it could only do so much because the body was still not moving. It was still stuck. And it was just like, how do we get to that? And I have had a living example in my home. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective.
I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home tonight forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Before the break, we were talking with you, Amy, about your decision to become a counselor and how your motivation to be a therapist has changed over time. But in this segment, I want to talk to you about some specific conditions and how the CHD community may be particularly at risk for these conditions. So let's start with depression. Can you tell me why you think members of our community are especially at risk for depression? Yes. I would like to first start with being able to describe a little bit about the approach that I take with clients, because I think that's going to be really important. As I've mentioned, I am a somatic experiencing practitioner. So what that means is that I am working with how a client comes in with how they present in their bodies. As I mentioned before, talk therapy tends to stay in the mind. Somatic Mm -hmm. therapy uses the body as the healing point. And so we all read nervous systems without us even really knowing because we pick up energy. We pick up a vibe of somebody. We right. know kind of like that person isn't approachable or that person is really open and receptive or that mm-hmm. person's in a mood, whatever. We're constantly <laughs> right. reading energy of people. And that's really you reading the nervous system because it mm. speaks for us before we really, I mean, there's a, there's a language that's happening between people that we don't even actually communicate on. And so I start from the very beginning working with the client's nervous system and allowing the body to have a space in the room. Because typically if somebody's had a lot of trauma, their nervous system is going to be pretty activated, um, mm. charged, that sure. tension. And that might show up in that kind of that fight or flight, like defensive, hyper vigilant, mm-hmm. really guarded. Or it could be somebody who's more in that freeze, shut down, autopilot, mm-hmm. numb, where they're mm-hmm. very disconnected. And so mm-hmm. if they're disconnected from me, they're most likely disconnected from their bodies as well. And mm-hmm. so we start really, I immediately start every session with tuning into the body and even allowing it to transition from where they were to where they are now and taking in the space, we orient, we tap in with the body and we kind of let the body decide when it's ready to proceed. So I'm always asking, you know, just what do you notice right now? What is your body telling you? Is there anything you need to make yourself more comfortable if it's changing the lighting, moving a pillow? Mm -hmm. Because we just, we put our blinders on and we just go in, sit down and just start talking and mm-hmm. we're not really paying attention to all the things that just came in with us. And mm-hmm. so that is so important because somebody who's had a lot of trauma, particularly really complex trauma, and, and that's where our kids come into play here because right. they have a whole history of a lot of trauma to their bodies and maybe other types of trauma as well. They, number one, find the experiences that's going on in their bodies really overwhelming. Sure. Or they've learned really easily how to disconnect from it because they've had to. So when, you know, somebody asks me about depression or even anxiety, I first start from looking at the person through the nervous system lens because what might appear as anxiety might be this angsty, activated 
tension, mm-hmm. dysregulation of their nervous mm-hmm. system that presents as anxiety, or if they're more in that shut down, disconnect, numb, autopilot place, that will look a lot like depression. And, right. And but so, you're saying maybe it's not depression. It's just the body's yeah. way of compensating. Yes. And coping yeah. that this is the way that it's learned to cope. Because I think okay. about my daughter and I don't know the specifics about your son, but my daughter came into the world immediately thrust into, into the world of medicine and immediately mm-hmm. taken away from me, immediately probed and poked and everything from the get go. And so she has never known what it's like to actually be in a grounded nervous mm-hmm. system where with healthy attachment, with mm-hmm. regulation, with self soothing. She didn't, she was robbed of that opportunity understandably so she had a major health right. condition that had to be addressed and so it's right. it is what it is but if you look at it purely through a nervous system lens it's like wow she's never ever once known what it's like to feel balanced calm grounded and in the nervous system at the very beginning has had to be in that self-protective mode so and, let me ask you this i know sure i know in my studies and for those of you who don't know, when I first went to college, I studied speech pathology, and then I went on to become a special education teacher. And we learned that the brain develops some skills at a certain time. And if you miss that window of opportunity, you may never get it back. Is That's there, true. Is there, that, those are critical periods. There right. are definitely critical periods in the brain. And when you throw these types of experiences on them, whether it's medical trauma, child abuse, neglect, different types of things that can impact a child's development, their brain literally changes. So can we help their brains to relearn it in a new way that's healthy? Yes. I mean, thank God for neuroplasticity. Right. Um, So we can retrain the brain. And the work that I'm doing is really because it's nervous system related. Our nervous system originates in the brain. So it's teaching the body how to respond differently. I mean, it's almost like there's these, the ways that we deal with threat and danger are automatic. We don't get to decide whether we run, whether we fight, whether we just collapse. That's not a choice that we make consciously. Right. The body makes that choice for us and it makes that choice based on what's the most likely outcome for survival. Mm -hmm. And And we shame ourselves a lot for the option that was chosen because we think, well, we should have ran or we should have fought. But you don't have that opportunity to think because that part of the brain that is involved in executive functioning and higher level reasoning gets shut off in the moment danger presents itself. And that could be imagined danger too, which is super important because the body doesn't make a distinction between real or imagined danger. If it experiences danger, it's as if a bear's chasing you and it's real. And the body will go into these self-protective strategies. And those self-protective strategies can be learned at a very young age. And so if you think about our kids who very early on had to learn how to basically go into collapse and shut down to be able to deal with everything that was coming in at them because they couldn't run away and they couldn't fight it off. Right, right. That is going to be a very easy place for them to go. And I think that's super important. And again, that gives me chills. And it also makes me tearful because I can see my daughter go there very easily when she feels overwhelmed. It's just, a, it's it's like this. She can just go know. in and, and it can seem like she's depressed. It can seem like she's melancholy. It can feel like she's just shut down. And now she has a language for that where it's like, mom, I'm shutting down because she can feel it. Wow. But, but if it's a learned behavior, though. It is. It is. It is. Oh, my goodness. Because that's where the body feels the most safest. Right. So, because she was in the hospital. She was being told she was a good girl when she was behaving that way. So that's reinforced. Yeah. It's been reinforced year after year, procedure after procedure. Right. And even as parents, we have to tell them you have to do this. You right. don't get a choice. Right. Right. And, and our ability as humans to be able to say no and set a boundary is really important and powerful. We have mm-hmm. to be able to say no. Yeah. And our kids learn very young that their no doesn't really mean much because they have right. to do all of these things. 
And so consequently, later on, later in their other behavior, they might have a really fierce no. They might be reactive. They might be really big and have these tantrums. They might have like these defiant streaks. I mean, it might show up in some of these other ways, but that's them being able to express their no, which they already know in these other arenas. They don't have a choice. My daughter, I don't want to take the meds. I see so many doctors. I don't want to have to do this. I'm I'm always like, yeah, I know, honey. It's really hard. I totally understand. And at the same time, this is the body you were given. And this is how we maintain it. And this is what we have to do. And so teaching her how to resource that and know that she can have the no in other places is really important. Some of these things can cause depression because having to deal with something like that long term again and again and again, where there's a lot of helplessness, like yes, no matter what I do, yeah. and it's persistent, it's not going anywhere. This is right. my lot in life. Yeah, it I have to have an, I have to have a pacemaker. I have to use yes. this filter monitor. I don't have a choice. I have to take all these meds. I have to take the meds. I have to see mm-hmm. the doctor. All of these have tos that most people don't have to deal with. Right. And so there's this helplessness and that just having no choice. And so that can be very depressing. And so, and then you tackle on top of that, the, that shut down, numb, disconnect capacity, because that has been a learned coping strategy. It can Mm -hmm. very much present itself as depression and it can feel very hard to kind of pull yourself out of because that's where it feels safe. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. The fact of the matter is, is that this family and the child within it is, it's a recurring, ongoing thing. And that is what makes it, I think, really challenging because there's no end point. And that's there what is makes it. it, you know, our child's death is the end point. But and even then, I don't think it would be the end because I think I we either. moms and dads, we replay things that we worry yes. What if I had made a different decision? Oh, and all the time. siblings would be the same way. Siblings all would think, oh, what if I had said something or I had jumped in? I was right. with an interview with Ginny Yancey just a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about CTSD, which is a phrase I had never yes. heard of before, but the continuous traumatic stress. And I think all of us, all of us in the heart world are dealing with that. Yes. I was going to mention the complex PTSD because you had talked about PTSD, which is this isolated incident of something that happens. But in our world and with medical trauma, well, not all medical trauma is this way, but with the CHD, it is this recurring chronic trauma trigger. And Mm -hmm. not to say that every single procedure, every single surgery or every single doctor appointment is triggering is traumatic but it's triggering the trauma from see that's what right that's what i've learned in working with the bereaved but still me program we've had a lot of psychologists on there talking about grief and loss Mm -hmm. and one of the women who came on the program said every time you have a new trauma 
it brings up old trauma, yes. especially if you haven't dealt with it. Now, if you've dealt yes. with it, you can probably go past it faster. But if it's something that's unresolved, it just complicates. It completely muddies the waters. You're right. It does. And that's what makes, I think, our population of kids and parents pretty unique. There's a lot of conditions that are chronic. That is definitely what we face here. And that's what I hear a lot when I read in the Facebook groups. It's like, how do I deal with this long term? Yeah, and, exactly. You know, what do I do when that, when at any moment something bad can happen? And the reality is that's true. And we all know it. And it's the thing that we don't talk about, but it's in the back of all of our minds that at any moment we could wake up and our child is really sick or they died or something bad has happened without any warning. And to yes. sit in that level of ambiguity and fear is not an adaptive response for the system. So think about it from the nervous system, okay? We mm -hmm. do not like as humans to sit in any kind of ambiguity, uncertainty, sure. and that is our life. And so right. we're in this chronic, ambiguous, fearful state, and that is not a place to live. So what does the body do in response to that? And that's where those self-protective coping strategies are because that is where we go into shutdown or we're in that hypervigilance. You have that mom who's that helicoptering going to say, okay, you know, or you have just the autopilot just going through the motions and just basically in survival mode. And it could be or, a combination or you have of the parents, those two. Right. Or you have the parents who leave. The parents who say, yes. I can't handle this. Can't handle and I it. think that's mm -hmm. why divorce is yes. high in our population. Yes. And that's that flea response because right. that they can't manage and it's too much. I mean, we even noticed right. that with my husband and I, when my daughter was in the hospital for real long periods of time, he really had a hard time tolerating being there. It would immediately activate the flea response for him. Sure. And one of the things that made a big difference for us is me respecting that was his way of coping and not that he didn't care, but that's how he had to cope. And I cried right. very differently. You yeah. know, I, had to, I need to know where I couldn't read. Yes, and, me too. And, I had to right? ask everybody everything. everything. I feel so everything. sorry for the nurses and doctors that had to deal with me. <laughs> yes, right? Same. I was in it. And we all have these prescriptive ways of coping, which are based on our own histories. Sure. And our own tolerance. And so I right. think that a really important concept here is something I talk to clients about all the time. It's called window of tolerance. And when we are in an adaptive window of tolerance, we have capacity to handle things. You know, life, okay. life is life. We move up and down. We move through the ups and downs of life. That is a given. Sometimes my clients want things to be easy and that sure. isn't life. Nothing I about think we all want easy. things. We all want things to be easy, Amy, but right. we know that but it's not that, going that, to be that that's way. Not real. So yeah, the it's real, not real trick then is how do we move through those times when they're not easy? What is our capacity mm -hmm. to manage when right. things are not easy? And if we have a flexible, adaptive window of tolerance, we are more able to resource ourselves. We're able to still connect and communicate. We're able to ground ourselves and feel some sense of self-soothing and calming. We right. can be flexible. We can deal with a lot of different possibilities. So that's sure. an adaptive window of tolerance. A more compressed window of tolerance, a more restricted window of tolerance is one that's more rigid, more sure. inflexible. Everything feels like a big deal. And so we know those people and I have those clients where even just the smallest thing, like having to wait too long at the target line feels mm. too, is it like, you can't handle so it. Angry. They can't yeah. handle it and they just right. storm out. And what's interesting is we saw that a lot in COVID. Those yes. were the carrots. And <laughs> witnessing that yeah. through the nervous system lens, it's like that person has such small capacity right now that this order at Starbucks is too much. And people right. make fun of that, but that really speaks to her nervous system capacity. Like she can't manage and that's really where she's at. When we're that, we're constantly feeling flooded with that fight, flight, flee energy. And then again, we all have our prescriptive places we go based on these learned patterns of coping. And so what I see with a lot of heart moms or heart parents and kids, families, let's just say the family system, there's a lot of shutdown going on. 
There's a lot mm-hmm. of just kind of that numbing autopilot going on or the big reactions to small things. It's hard to have this expanded window of tolerance in a family surrounding a chronic life-threatening health condition. That's asking your nervous system to be calm and grounded when a bear's chasing you. And that just doesn't go right. inside not... with, with, with survival. Yes. Right. right, right. Okay, so let me ask you this. I have talked to so many parents who were like us. They were very tuned into their kids. They were doing everything they could to help their kids through multiple procedures because these were parents of children with complex congenital heart defects, not somebody who had one surgery and then they're dead, but somebody who had multiple things going on. only, right? (laughs) So, well, yeah. So many of us get our kids to adulthood and we're like, yes, we made it to adulthood. We defy the odds. And then the kids go off. They don't keep taking their meds. They don't follow up with their pediatric cardiologist or if they've transitioned to an adult cardiologist, to their adult cardiologist. They start drinking and partying and doing things that they weren't doing before that they know are bad for them. They start smoking. They get tattoos. Is all of this just a way of them saying, okay, I'm not dealing with that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a normal person? Yeah, I think I'm already seeing that with my daughter and exerting her independence. And that makes me come back to that no and how important it is to be able to say no and set a boundary. And even my healthy heart child had that literally the day he turned 18, he said to me, mom, take me off of Life 360. Or he didn't (laughs) say, take me off. He said, can I please get off Life 360 now? What is Life 360? Life 360 is the app that you can track your kids where they are. Oh, and so, okay. You know, obviously you I didn't track, use that with my kids. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> but it can be really beneficial. It's nothing like what we grew up with when our parents had no idea what we were doing. So it's a program and immediately he wanted to be completely separate, which is a natural developmental milestone for independence. That's that separation and individuation that is a crucial part of development as kids become adults. And they start that right. process very young from the two-year-old that says, no, I do it. To right. the teenager that says, can I please get off Life 360? And then they wanting to go out. And so wanting to be normal, quote unquote, and wanting to have a life where that isn't part of the constant conversation is a natural desire. Almost and healthy, right? It's That's very actually healthy. really healthy. Yeah. It's healthy. And they're wanting to say no is super healthy. But how do we let go of that as parents? Again, I'm just dealing with that with my daughter who's about to turn 18. It's hard. And, it's really and, hard, and Amy. It's <laughs> another stage of fear. It's a different kind of fear that is now, and I knew this would come, but it was always like, I'll deal with it when it comes because there's already right. what I'm dealing with now. <laughs> right. And you can only deal with so much. <laughs> right. And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, here we are. It's here. And- it's here. What do we do with it? So my kid was out of care for five years, out of care for five years. Here I am on a podcast talking about all these different issues, <laughs> and I cannot convince my own child to see a pediatric cardiologist. I cannot convince my own child, please take your medicine. I couldn't. My child wanted to be normal. And my child said, I know my body. Trust me. It's going to be okay. It was horrendous. Now my child is back in care. I'm feeling a little bit more relieved, but I'm wondering for those five years that there was no continual care, is there going to be some consequence that is paid later because of that? I don't know. But it's like you said, you can only deal with what you've got dealing with on your plate right now. And that's enough for us. Right. So what can we do as parents? Because I found what I had to do was I had to let go and let God. I had to let go of my child's care. It wasn't on me anymore. And my child was not going to let me continue to take over. I had to let go and I had to trust that God was going to be there for my child and that my child did indeed know if the body was going to need something and would take care of it. There is a level of letting go that is required. And again, I can't speak to that quite yet, but I know that it's coming. However, from speaking to other heart moms, particularly those are the ones that I talk to. I don't typically talk to the dads. 
it is that a letting go and trusting that they do understand at some level because they've spent their entire life with us educating them and resourcing them that that wasn't for nothing. That right. what I try to reinforce with my daughter when she does crazy things like wants to try to vape with her friends or wants to drink those stupid monster drinks with caffeine. Yes. And oh my gosh. Yes. Which yeah. every kid wants to do, but I'm just like, honey, you can't do that. Massive caffeine. We know what you caffeine does to the it. heart. Please don't do that. Yes, I do. Right? I hear and you. And so I hear you. we have worked as a team to get you to this point. And there's a reason why we've done all of these things and really validating for her. I know this totally sucks. And I know this yeah. is really hard. And it's not me that has to do it. It's you that has to do it. And right. Just really me validating her, but also sharing at the same time this worries me and concerns me. And I should say, as a side note, my daughter has some cognitive impairment because she had some brain damage due to chronic hypoxia. So she functions, she's 17, almost 18 and developmentally about 12, 13. And so we are approaching this place where we have to become guardians for her for not forever, but But she's not until she's she's able to. She's Mm -hmm. not ready to make those decisions for herself, particularly for her care. So we're going to be extending that, but it's a whole nother ballgame because now we have what appears to be an 18 year old, but really is still a a middle schooler and and the disconnect there and trying to explain things. And especially since her friends. Her friends are yes. her age and her friends and, are right. doing things differently than what she and can do. So that's a whole of her, oh yes, my it's gosh. A, that's a whole other ball of wax. It is. And I'm not alone in that either because these kids, there's consequences to their brains and their bodies as a result yes. of all of this early intervention. And again, I knew all of this, even when it was happening, I'm like, this is going to come back. This is going to come back. Cause I knew, right. I knew enough, right. but you just don't yeah. know when you do what you can to save your child. But the consequences are what they are and trying to inform and educate, but giving, I think what's super important is giving them freedom and choice where in places where it doesn't have such big consequence. And so when you say, what can parents do? It's like, okay, well, where can she exercise the no and it be okay? And we can't pick every battle. My child yeah. is, she's got a lot of stuff going on. She's pretty impulsive. She's just a, a mess. She's like pig pen <laughs> everywhere she goes. And so it's just like, it's always going on. And so in day to day, Zach can be like, oh my God, can you just pick up your room? But there are ways that it's just like, can she exert her independence in her space? What she wants to wear, how she wants to do things, what she can do. Cause then it's like, I'm going to have to take charge in these other arenas that you're not ready to do yet and to hopefully get you to a place developmentally to be able to understand the consequences of these things. So she's not quite there yet. She understands to a degree, but she's not quite there yet. And it's going to be a while, but eventually she's going to have to be like your son and have to take over things. Hopefully we don't know, but I think the important thing is where can they exert the no? I love it. it. Yeah. That's the important thing. It does have to be respected. I can't believe our time is up already, Amy. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to have you come back on the show. I mean, truly, we obviously have a much longer, deeper conversation, but I think my one takeaway from this is that we all need somatic treatment because all of us physically have been through stuff. This is not just emotional. It is not just mental health. It is our body's nervous system. That needs a break and needs to be retrained on how to react so that we can be healthier. And wow, that's just huge. Truly, I have chills right now thinking, okay, I'm not a bad mom. I'm not a bad person. I'm okay. My body has been through trauma because I've had to hand my baby off to a surgeon three times and I've had to deal with an uncertain future for the last 28 years. Yeah. That changes you inside and out. It definitely it does. Truly changes you. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on the program today, Amy. This has been enlightening and I really, really appreciate it. I am so glad. This was a really awesome experience and I'm glad we had a chance to talk. And I love anytime 
I can share this experience with my community, which my heart community, because this is stuff we don't know. And it's yeah. been life changing for me and for our family. And, yeah. and every, when we all need to know this because of just exactly what you just said. And yeah, so what we I'm, I'm here as a resource. <laughs> Maybe we can have you come back on the show in 2023 to talk about exactly what kind of steps that you've taken and some of the success sure. that you have seen, because I think having a role model would definitely help so many people. I know it would help me. (laughs) Okay. Well, that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today, my friends. You can find us on iHeartRadio and subscribe. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time, wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.